repeat what the brother said in Arabic, just translate it. We begin by praising Allah and we praise Him and uh, we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. And we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah, his final messenger. And after that, the best speech is the book of Allah. And the best way is the way of Muhammad. And the worst of all the things, or the worst of all the affairs, are those matters that are newly introduced into the religion. And that every matter that is newly introduced into the religion is in misguidance. All the misguidance is going astray. And all the going astray is in the fire. The Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said in a really poignant and beautiful hadith, what do I have to do with this world? What do I have to do with this world? I am like a traveler on a long journey who takes rest underneath the shade of a tree and continues on his journey. The Prophet Muhammad May God's peace and blessings be upon him. Was truly an extraordinary human being. And one of the one of the evidences that we could use to help establish in the hearts and the minds of people that this man was truly what he claimed to be, a prophet of God. Not a liar, not a deluded person. Not a deceiver, not an opportunist, but truly a truthful caller to Allah's way. One of the evidences that we can use is the almost complete lack of worldliness of the Prophet Muhammad. Even though married to Khadija, one of the noble women amongst the Arabs, and one of the wealthy women amongst the Arabs, although the Prophet Muhammad himself is from noble birth, his actual immediate family was not very wealthy, but Khadija was extremely wealthy. And the Prophet Muhammad, in fact, proved himself as a very good tradesperson. So in spite of his marriage to Khadija, in spite of the wealth, this wealth was spent in caring for the orphans and the needy and the poor and freeing slaves. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad was offered kingship. He was offered wealth. He was offered women. He was offered all the attractive things that the pagan Arabs could imagine that might entice him to give up calling to his message. So they invited him to the luxuries of the world, leadership and power, wealth, sexual enjoyment. But all of these things, the Prophet Muhammad turned them down. He said to them, if you give me the moon in one hand and you give me the sun in the other, I would still not give up according to this message. There is an incident when Omar, who was the close friend and companion of the Prophet Muhammad and the second rightly guided caliph of the Muslims after the Prophet Muhammad's death. There was an incident when Umar came to the roof where the Prophet Muhammad used to sometimes rest and sleep. And when Umar arrived, the Prophet Muhammad sat up and Umar could see the marks on the arm of the Prophet, that the reed mat had left an indentation in the Prophet's arm. He used to sleep on a reed mat. And Umar began to cry. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you are God's Prophet. You are God's Messenger. The kings and the emperors 
of Persia and Rome. They recline on cushions and fine beds. But you are the messenger of God. And you are sleeping <coughs> on a reed mat and a cushion that is filled with the fibers of a palm tree. And Umar said, and the Prophet Muhammad said to Umar, O oh Umar, do you wish that God will forward to me the good things in this life and leave me nothing for the next? This is the messenger of God, this is Muhammad. Sleeping on a reed mat. When he died, he left nothing. Nothing except the clothes that were on his body and a few pots that were in his house that they used to cook from. He didn't leave dinar or dirham, not a penny. And this was a man who commanded a nation of people by the time of his death, they had conquered the whole of Arabia. The governor of the Muslims was in Yemen. Yemen from where the spice and incense trade went, the frankincense. This is a man who could, could have lived in any type of luxury he liked. Yet this is how he died. And his companions followed that example. Because they realized that this world is nothing. They were travelers. Like strangers. And they lived like travelers. And they lived like strangers. In this world. Because what did they have to do with it and its pleasures and its delights? The only reason, the only thing that we need from this life are good deeds. Because that is what is going to be weighed up for us on the scales when we meet our Lord on the Day of Judgment. And that's what is the meaning of the saying of the Prophet ﷺ. What do I have to do with this world? You see, a traveler on a long journey <coughs> needs to take rest. If you're on a long journey and you don't rest, then what will happen? You'll fall off your horse, you'll fall off your camel, you'll crash your car. You can't just keep on driving or riding indefinitely. In order to reach your destination, you have to take rest. In order to reach paradise, we have to spend some time in this world. But it's not to rest, but to get what we need. And what we need are good things. But many people are deluded. Many people are taken in. They are confused by this world. How many people have sold their souls for a miserable price? And it is a miserable price. Because what they have sold is their akhirah. What they have sold is paradise. What they have sold is the goodness in the life to come. And they sold it for what? A pittance. And the pittance they sold it for is the soul. The Prophet Muhammad once he came across the rotting carcass of a dead goat. He said to his companions, who will buy this for me? Who will buy this from me for one dirham? They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we wouldn't buy it from you for less than that. And the Prophet said, Verily, the world in the sight of your Lord is more worthless than this rotting carcass is in your eyes. So people have sold the eternal delight of paradise for the rotting carcass of a dead goat. Not only that, we're fighting over it like dogs, fighting over it, killing each other over it. How are those people going to stand? How are they going to stand? How is Bush and Blair, how are they going to stand in front of God on the Day of Judgment, having slaughtered so far over 100,000 human beings just in Iraq? I mean, you know, don't, I won't get carried away with this. How? For what? For oil, for dunya, for this pathetic world. And how long are we here? You see, no one's going to live forever, brothers and sisters. That's the reality. No one is going to live forever. You are going to die, and I am going to die. And it could be soon, or it could be sooner. Because that's all it is. It's soon or sooner. There's no later. 
Because your life, however long you live it, is going to be ended too soon. Sooner than you can imagine. You know, my son is in a couple of years' time, my older son, he's going to be sitting, maybe, in a chair in some university like you guys are. A couple of years. I remember when my child was lying, a little baby, on my chest. My first child. And I remember that I couldn't sleep at night because I was thinking, is he breathing or not? You know, I was worried that he's going to stop breathing. And now he's a big lad with a moustache. Just like that, brothers and sisters. It's just like that. I've been talking to people like you for 19 years. It just seems like yesterday. It just seems like yesterday. It's the life. Believe me, the life is over. It's gone before you know it. If I live till 80, I am halfway through. I'm over halfway if I live to 80. Or the average for us is 60, the Muslims. It's our average lifespan. So some of us will last a bit longer. Some of us will die younger. But you know what? None of us have a guarantee you're going to live to that age. You don't know. We don't know. But today, this, maybe this is it. Maybe tonight is your last night. Maybe today is your last day. The Prophet وسلم, used to tell us and warn us, don't go to sleep thinking that you're going to live until the morning. And don't get up in the morning thinking that you're going to make it to the end of the day. That is how you've got to think about death. That's how you've got to think about it. Is today my last day? Is tonight my last night? An old man comes asking for help. I don't have time, I have work to do. But you know what? I'm thinking... I need some ajah. I need some reward with Allah. What if today's my last day? What if, what if this is the last good thing that I can do? Give him five minutes. Huh? There's an old lady. She needs her help across the road. It's getting cold. You know down the road you have some, an old person. Maybe they can't you know, afford the heating. Something. You can do something. Don't leave it because you don't know. Maybe you don't have a chance. Maybe tonight is the last night. Maybe that today is the day you get happy slapped to death. That's not for you. And what sort of sick thing is that? What sort of sick thing is that? Maybe it's you. Today, on the way home, it's dark. Maybe today you're the one the car's going to run over. Maybe you're the one who's going to slip on the railway lines or whatever. Maybe just your heart will give it. I have a friend of mine who's a young lad. 25, whatever, he just discovered he's got heart disease. In the Ramadan, he said he was nearly dying. And another friend of mine, another Muslim brother, young guy, young compared to me, right, anyway. He's been traveling to Africa. He's found he's got elephantitis. SubhanAllah. Brothers and sisters, don't think because you're young, you're immune. And that's how you think. You know, I know, I remember when I was your age. I remember, I used to smoke and take drugs and do so much rubbish. I used to think, yeah, you know what, when I'm growing up, science will find a cure for all of these things anyway. Yeah, that's what we used to think. And you know what, they still haven't found a cure. Just, alhamdulillah, Allah guided me to Islam. Death brothers, death sisters. Death is the reality. And if you're wise, a wise person is not a person who goes to city university and comes out with a degree. It's not, does it make you wise? Does it make you intelligent? Does it make you clever? The wise person is the person who remembers death. And the one who remembers death the most is going to be the wisest person. Because you know what? The more you remember death, the more likely you are, you are to make the right decision in life. Because if you're just going to be thinking, yeah, what am I going to say when I meet Allah on the Day of Judgment? How is this going to impact me and my brain? Is this going to take me to paradise or the hellfire? If you think like that, you'll always make the right decision. So the wise one is the one who remembers death. So my brothers and sisters, what we're going to get today is a brief summary of the events 
what is going to happen when we die, step by step, stage by stage. And the way we're going to do it is like this. First, we're going to talk about the evil soul. The evil soul is a soul of the person or the human being who has either disbelieved in Allah and rejected his messengers. Those are the worst of the people and they're in for the worst they're in for the worst time in the life to come. But we can include in that the sinners, the criminals, the fornicators, the drug takers and dealers and pushers, plenty of them amongst the Muslims. The murderers, the thieves, the liars and the promise breakers, the innovators, they're in for a hard time too. The evil and the wicked soul. So death will come to the good soul and to the evil soul. But when it comes to the evil soul, what is going to happen? First of all, the angel of death will come to take the soul. When it's a time for the death and it's appointed, and the decreed time, there is nothing that you can do to escape it. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. When it's your time, the angel of death is going to come and take your soul. If you are a wicked and evil soul, then the angel of death will look terrifying. And not only will there be the angel of death, there will also be the gathered angels. Because the angel of death will take out the soul. And the soul of the wicked person will be so reluctant to come out of the body. In fact, the prophet described this as you can imagine. Imagine wool that is wet. Wrap round a stick of thorns. So imagine you want to separate the stick of thorns from that wool. Can you imagine how you're going to tear the wool? That is how the soul will tear the veil, will cling to the body, and it will come be you have to be torn out of the body like that. Because this evil soul does not want to leave the body. From the moment of death, the reality that is ignored all its life is come home. It doesn't want to leave. But the angel of death will rip it out. And the gathered angels also in the most terrifying appearance will take this soul and they will wrap it in a cloth that is coarse and it stinks. A most awful stench. And even the soul itself will stink. And these angels will wrap it layer and layer in this coarse and stinking cloth. And then this soul will be taken up through the heavens. And as it's been taken up through the heavens, the inhabitants of the heavens will call it by every wicked name that it was known by in this earth. You lying soul, you cheating soul, you disbelieving soul, like that. And when it gets to the highest heaven, it will be sought permission to pass. It will not be given. In fact, it will be ordered to be thrown down to the torment in the grave. And this soul, therefore, will be thrown down back to its place in the grave. Then, two angels will appear. Their names are Munkar and Nakir. These angels will sit this soul up in the grave and they will begin to interrogate it. Interrogate. There is no escaping their interrogation. And they will ask three questions. The first question will be Who is your Lord? <coughs> Who is your Lord? And this soul will let out a cry a cry of pain. Ah! I don't know. They will ask the next question. What was your deed? What was your way of life? What was your religion? It means all of those things. Deed. Again. This soul will let out a cry of pain. I don't know. What did you think of this man? That was sent amongst you. Meaning Muhammad. And this soul will say... I heard the people say this, and I heard the people say that, and I said what they said. So the angels will say, you lived in doubt. 
and you died in doubt, and inshallah, God willing, you will be raised up in doubt. And then a man will come with a hammer. If this man was to strike, this man is deaf and dumb and blind. If he was to strike a mountain with this hammer, it would turn it to dust. And he will strike the soul of this wicked person and it will let out a scream from the pain of this blow that will be heard by every creature except men and jinn. And the soul and the grave of the soul of the wicked person will begin to constrict on that person so much that their rib bones will crush each other. And then it will be shown to this person a window in the grave. A window in the grave. And this window will be a window to paradise. And the voice will say, this would have been your place in paradise if you had been good. And then that window will be closed. And a window will be open to hellfire. And it will be said, this is your place in hellfire. And then some of the heat and the smoke and the stench of the hellfire will come into the grave. And this person will begin to pray. He will begin to make dua. He will begin to ask, Oh Allah, don't ever let the day of judgment come. And so the life of this person in the grave will be like a long, long, long time. And also a man will appear at the foot of this person, the wicked soul. And the man will look, or the woman will walk, the evil soul will look, and then will say, who are you? Because you abode an evil end. And the man will say, I am your deeds. And he's ugly, his appearance is ugly, his clothes are tattered. He said, I'm your deeds. He said, I only found you very slow to, to obey Allah and very quick to disobey Allah. And may you have a wicked end. And so the life of this person in the grave will be a life of suffering and torment. Eventually the day of judgment will come. The day of judgment for the disbeliever and for the wicked soul is one day like 50,000 years. Yom al It will be a day of terror and a day of fear. People will be resurrected physically. Not just their souls but their bodies. And they will be naked and uncircumcised, and barefoot. But the terror of that day will be so extreme, no one will notice the condition of another. And people will be running like they are in a drunken riot. But this running is from fear. Each one running from their brother, from their sister, from their mother, from their father. Running from their children. Why? Because on that day, everybody will only care about themselves. They will only care about their own deeds. And they will be running after the other person. So the wife will run after the husband. Why? For one thing. She wants from him those deeds. You oppressed me. You oppressed me. You didn't give me my rights. You ordered me to do things beyond my capacity. You didn't care for me like you were supposed to. You didn't look after me. Now pay me from your deeds. That's what it's going to be about, brothers and sisters. Your mother will come after you for every word of disrespect, for every act of disobedience. She's going to come after you to kill your own mother. She won't care. If Allah says, throw your son into the hellfire and you'll be saved, she won't hesitate for one instant to throw you into the hellfire. Your own mother. That's how terrifying it is that day. 
That's how terrifying it is. And that's why the people are running. But people, bit by bit, they will be gathered. And the sun will be brought close. So close that people will sweat profusely. The sweat will be so much that some people will be up to their ankles in sweat. Those people are the fortunate ones. Those are the people who worked hard and they sweated in this life. So they will sweat less in the life to come. Some people will be up to their knees. Some people up to their waists. And some people will be bridled with sweat. And shade? There is no shade. The only shade on that day is the shade underneath the throne of Allah. And no one will be allowed under that shade except those whom Allah permits. This is the day of terror and the day of fear. One day of 50,000 years. As for those people who have disbelieved in God and made partners with God, and used to consider that something in this world was equal with God, and they used to worship that thing along with God, then God will not ask them even about their deeds. They will be chained, and they will be thrown into the hellfire. No reckoning. No questioning. The evil of their making partners with God was so severe, there is no good deed that could possibly balance it out in the scales. They will be thrown into the hellfire. The angels will say, didn't someone come and warn you about this? Didn't someone warn you about this? And they will say, yes, someone warned us, but we didn't listen. We thought they were mad. We thought they were deluded. If only... We have used our intelligence, we wouldn't now be in the hellfire. What is this hellfire? This hellfire is so vast that it is pulled by 70,000 bridles. And each bridle is pulled by 70,000 angels. A stone that was dropped from the top of the hellfire took 70 years to reach the bottom. Its heat is so intense that some parts of the hellfire began to consume other parts of the hellfire. So Allah gave the hellfire permission to breathe, to stop itself consuming itself. It is a place of pain and suffering and torment, the fire of which is 70 times hotter than the fire of this earth. But the thing about it is, that it's not a fire that will kill you. People will neither live nor will they die. Their skins will burn, but Allah will recreate their skins. And their skins will burn again. And Allah will recreate their skins. That is so that the people can continue to experience the torment. Imagine 50,000 years. The sun bore close. Then you're thrown into the hellfire. How will your thirst be? How thirsty will you be? The people will be raging with thirst. They will be mad with thirst. And they will plead and they will beg. And they will ask the angels who guard the whole fire. And they will call out for some drink, for some relief. And they will get a drink. The drink is boiling water that is like molten brass that will school their faces and burn out their insides. And because of the suffering of the hell fire, the people will experience hunger, intense hunger. But the only thing that they will have to eat is the tree of Zakum. The tree of Zakum is in the deepest part of the hellfire where the people will have to go to eat from it. Its fruits are like the heads of devils. It is so bitter that people cannot swallow it. But it is all they will have to eat and they will be forced to eat it. But the bitterness of the fruit will only intensify their thirst. So they will drink from rivers of pus. The rivers of pus come from the wounds that are flowing out of the people. 
the people's wounds are flowing with pus and then make rivers. How long will this last? How long will this punishment last? It will last forever. It will never, ever, ever end. In fact, on the Day of Judgment, Allah will say to the people of Hellfire, Allah will bring Iran. And Allah will say to the people of Hellfire, do you recognize this? And they will stretch their necks. And they will say, yes, my Lord, it is death. And Allah will slaughter the ram. And there will be no more death. And because of that, the people of Hellfire will fall into even deeper despair. It is not only a physical punishment. It's a punishment of despair. It's a punishment of mockery. Because in the Hellfire is the devil who will laugh at the people. Even though he himself is suffering, he will laugh at them and mock them. This only increases their torment. He will laugh and mock them that you listen to me. And I made false promises and you accepted them. And God made you true promises and you rejected them. And he will mock the people. There is no pleasure, no happiness, not a trace of it. Nothing except misery, anger, Hatred. This is the hellfire. On the day of judgment, Allah will take the man who had enjoyed the most in this life. The most. Had the most pleasure and the most enjoyment in this life. And Allah will dip this man into the hellfire and take him out. Allah will ask him, did you enjoy the life? He will say, oh my Lord, I don't remember enjoying anything of the life. So it doesn't matter what your worldly pleasures are, they will avail you nothing. The memory of them will not even exist due to the pain and the suffering in the hellfire. There is no respite. The hellfire is the kindled wrath of Allah. The kindled wrath of God. And it's purest form. And Allah will leave the people there and He will forget them. He will forget them as they forgot Him. As the people forgot to remember Allah in this life, Allah will forget them and will not care about them. That is the end of the wicked soul. How about the good soul, the pious soul? Well, when the good soul dies, as the Prophet Muhammad told us, this world is a paradise for the disbeliever and it is a prison for the believer. Sid your mu'min, dun It's a prison for the believer and it's a jannah for the kafir. So when the angel of death comes to take the soul of the pious believing servant, this is like something that has been coming for too long. We've been waiting for it too long. And how will the soul come out of the pious person? You know, if, if you ever see a leaf and from it in the morning there is a, a drop of dew, and you know, you just touch the leaf and the dew falls in the pot. That's how the soul of the believer will come out. That is how it is hastening to come out of this body of this life. And the angel, which is beautiful in appearance, will wrap this soul in a sweet smelling, smelling soft cloth. And the angels gathered, they will wrap this soul in a sweet smelling soft cloth. And this soul will be taken up through the heavens. And the inhabitants of the heavens will call it and praise it by all the good names that it was known in this life. Even the good soul has to go to the questioning in the grave. So this soul is admitted through the heavens, but it still has to return to the questioning of the grave. But for the believing soul, it's easy. When Munkar and Nikir come and they sit on this soul, and they say, who was your Lord? They say, Allah. My Lord was Allah. What was your deen? My deen was Islam. Submission to God. 
What did you think of this man, Muhammad? They say, he is Muhammad, the messenger of God. How did you know? He said, I read the book of Allah. I read the book of Allah, and I believed in it. So, the angels will say, you lived in certainty, you died in faith. So, inshallah, you'll be raised. And then, the soul and the grave of the soul will become like a garden of paradise. Although before the soul will be shown, a window that will show the place in hellfire. This would have been the place in hellfire if you had been bad. But that will be closed and a, a window to the garden of paradise will be open. And the grave itself will become full of light and sweet scent. And this person in the grave, the soul in the grave, will start to make dua. dua. Oh Allah, let the day of judgment come. Let it come. And the life in the grave will be short. And the day of judgment itself will be light between the two prayers. Light between the Asaf and the Maghrib will be a short time. But the day of judgment we have to say, even for the believing soul, is a serious day. Even for the believers, the day of judgment is a serious day. There are some very important events. And these things, by the way, are only for the believers. Those people who have disbelieved, they're already in hell. They're not questioned. The people who will be questioned are the believers. They will be asked about their deeds. Because there are people who believe but did evil actions. And there are people who believe and they did good actions. So now for the believing soul, everything will be easy. Allah will question the believing soul, and it will be a light questioning. And this questioning will be between the believer and Allah, and there will be no veil between the believer and Allah. Allah will talk to them directly. If the Allah starts to interrogate the person and question them severely, this is a sign of a bad end. But if the questioning is light, it is a sign of a good end. Another event that will happen on the Day of Judgment is people will be given their scrolls, the scrolls of deeds. So whoever scroll of deeds is written in Sidji, they will get their scroll from behind their back and they will read it and say, what sort of book is this? It doesn't leave out anything except it's written. Woe to me. But the person whose deeds are written in Illyun is a book of good deeds. They'll go back to their people and say, look at my book. Look at my book. Look at this. Because it's good. Full of good deeds. And the deeds also will be weighed in scales. So whoever scale of deeds is heavy with good, will go to paradise. And whoever scale of deeds is heavy with evil, will go to hellfire. But that is not before another event has taken place. The weighing of the deeds is after something else. And that what has to take place is the recompense. And this even is for the disbelievers. Everyone will have to face the recompense. What is the recompense? Simple. You said something bad about me behind my back. Abdul Rahim is this and Abdul Rahim is that. And you said some lies about me. You said something about me that I wouldn't like, even if you said it to my face, I wouldn't like it. That's backbiting. If it's true, and you said a bad thing about me, something I wouldn't like behind my back, that's backbiting. If it's a lie, it's slumber. The Quran describes it like eating the flesh, the dead flesh of your brother. Like you dig up someone's grave and you eat their flesh. That's what backbiting is. How about slumber? But you know what? Go ahead. That's what the, those are the scholars. When they, the scholars used to hear, when they used to hear someone was backbiting them, they used to say, "That's nice because he's working for me. He's working for my Akhirah. Because that person is going to have to pay on the day of judgment for every word and everything. They're going to have to give from their good deeds according to the evil that they say. So remember, sisters, when you start backbiting some other sister and saying bad things about her or slandering somebody. Yeah, you remember. It's like you're doing all your good deeds and just giving it to them. That's what's going to happen. You're going to have to pay from your prayers and from your fasting and from your sadaqah. You're going to have to give from your good deeds according to the evil that you said. And brothers, 
Same for you. Why will us and sisters you are sniggering? What, brothers don't backbite? You know, we used to say, oh yeah, this is something the women do. Not anymore. If it ever was. The brothers are the worst backbiters of all. You find the people leading and the head of everything in every Islamic society, wherever it is, who do you find? Doing all the work, making all the effort, organizing everything. It's the sisters, most of the time. What do the brothers do? Too busy trying to look like a gangster. <laughs> Is his demand. <laughs> yeah. So what's going to happen? Gangsta. Yeah. On the day of judgment, gangsta. Yeah. What's going to happen? All those people you gangsta, they're going to come to you. Pay me. Pay me now. You used to mock me. You used to make fun of me. You used to deal drugs to me. You used to do this to me and that to me. Pay. Give me your good deeds and you're going to have to pay. And you know, some people come on the day of judgment with mountains, like oh, mountains of good deeds. But you know what? They backbite this one, they hurt that one, they injured that one, they killed that one, and they'll have to pay and pay and pay until they've got nothing left. But you know what? There's still more debts to pay. So you know what they have to do? Then they have to start taking the sins of other people. Because if you don't have any good deeds, then you take the sins. And another thing I want to think you to think about. You think it's just about you and what you do? No. Every person who looks at any one of us, any person who looks at us, smoking, drinking, clubbing, pubbing, swearing, misbehaving, oh yeah, look, that Muslim's doing it. Must be alright then. You know what? If they are inspired by your misguidance, not only do you get the sin of the evil thing, but you're going to have to pay for their evil deeds as well. Because you guided them to do wrong. You encouraged them to do wrong. And therefore you will get the punishment of their sin. Well, they will get the punishment, but you'll get it as well. That's why every single murder that has ever taken place, the worst of the two sons of Adam has a share in it. The worst of the two of the sons of Adam has a share in every murder. Think about that. Think about the way you behave. Think about what you say and what you do. Every time you lie and you cheat and you steal. And someone knows there's a Muslim doing that. You're going to pay. And every person who follows you. And every person who follows them because they followed you. And what if it goes on for a hundred generations? You have to pay for all of that. How about if you inspire someone to do good? You inspire them. You guide them to be Muslim. You know what? Then you get the reward. Every time they pray, every time they fast, you get rewarded. When they have kids and their kids pray and their kids fast, you get rewarded for that too. What do you want to do with your life, brothers and sisters? You want to reap the rewards? We're going to pile up the bad deeds. You got a problem with your Muslim brother and sister? You better sort it out right now. Believe me, you better sort it out now. Because if you don't sort it out now, then there is a bridge that is thinner than a hair and sharper than a sword that is stretched over the hellfire. And there is not one of us except we're going to have to walk across it. That's if we die Muslim. That's if we die Muslim. We have to cross the Sirat. Thinner than a hair and sharper than a sword. Some people will go like the blinking of an eye. Some like lightning. Some like fast horses. Some running, some walking, some crawling. And some will be pulled into the hellfire. But two people, two Muslims, they had a problem with each other. If you didn't sort your problem out in this life, this is a dunya problem, right? If you didn't sort it out in this life, you will have to wait on the bridge until you sort it out. You will not pass, you will not be able to go. You have to wait there until you have resolved your problems. My brothers and sisters, resolve your problems now. 
get forgiveness from your Muslim brothers and sisters now. Because a day will come soon where there is no money to exchange. There is no seeking forgiveness from people. The only thing on that day you're going to exchange is your deeds. So make your amends now, my brothers and sisters. Because the time is coming very soon when you won't be able to do it. And you're just going to pay with your deeds. But you know, for the true believer, there's going to be a time in the paradise, the day of judgment, like I said, will be smooth. Because the Muslim is the one from whose tongue and hand the Muslims are saved. The Muslim, the character of the Muslim is the one who does not abuse with his tongue or with his hand the other Muslims. It's the characteristic of the believer. In fact, not only that, you won't even find true believers get involved in useless arguments, let alone something worse than that. Keeps his promises, fulfills his trusts, speaks the truth. Says his prayers, the first thing Allah will ask about on the day of judgment are the prayers. The first thing Allah will ask us about on the day of judgment are the prayers. I'll repeat it again. The first thing Allah will ask about on the day of judgment are the prayers. A person Allah will ask the angels to look at a person's prayers. If they have not said all of their obligatory prayers, Allah is merciful. He will tell the angels, see if he has any supererogatory prayers to make up the deficiency in the obligatory prayers. And a deficiency here means, brothers and sisters, right? Not only you didn't say the prayers, not only that you didn't say them, right? What if you said them, you said them badly? What if you said them when you were thinking about, I don't know, your exam or that nice girl I saw the other day, right? That's not a prayer. You're making the motions, maybe you fulfill the obligations, but what is that? It's not a prayer. That's a deficient, that's a deficient prayer. So what if you're deficient? Allah's merciful. Look, see if they've got supererogatories. Why the importance of praying the sunnah prayers. Because it makes up for the deficiency. But check this out, brothers and sisters. Check this out, please remember this. If you have not reached sufficiency in your prayers, Allah will not look at any of the rest of your deeds. He won't look at your sadaqah. He won't look how good you were to your mum. He won't look at anything. If your prayers are not in order, Allah will not look at the rest of your deeds. And then the zakah, the same. And then the fasting Ramadan, the same. And then the hajj, the same. Only when Allah has looked at those, then Allah will begin to look at the other deeds. And you know what? They have a special name these days for a Muslim who prays, a namazi. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Amazing. Oh, that one's in the Mazi. Actually prays. SubhanAllah. What, are, what planet are these people on? Oh, I know what planet they're on. They're planet on dunya intoxified. That's what they are. They're intoxicated with the world. And believe me, you'd be better to be intoxicated with crack cocaine than be intoxicated with the dunya. Better. Because you know what? People who are on crack cocaine wake up with a headache. But when you're intoxicated with the dunya, you know what? You're just lost. Brothers and sisters, the day of judgment is real. Even if we are believers in Allah, it's not enough. <coughs> Allah tells us, <laughs> How many times in the Quran does Allah mention belief with righteous action? Because the two things come together. If a person is a true believer in Allah, they will do the righteous actions. <coughs> so my brothers, the people have passed across the bridge. And some of the Muslims, they will go into the hellfire. Don't think 
Like some people say, oh, you know, okay, so I'll go to the hellfire for a bit. Remember about that person who's dipped in the hellfire, couldn't remember anything good. You don't want to go to hellfire, even for a millisecond. But some people are going to go. So where are they going to go? Believers. And then the people will pass across the bridge, and they will gather outside the gates of paradise. And then Allah will give permission for the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to intercede. And in fact, not only the Prophet Muhammad, all of the Prophets, they will intercede for their people. And the righteous, and the truthful, and the scholars, and the martyrs, okay, those people who died and gave their life, they will be, have the right to intercede. And they will intercede for their people, from their relatives and their friends and the people they know, they will intercede for them. Oh Allah, they used to pray with us, they used to fast with us, they used to make pilgrimage with us. And Allah will give these people protection and they will go into the hellfire and He will give them permission to take out everybody who has a mustard seed's worth of faith. And then after that, the intercession will continue and they will take out the people who have an atom's worth of faith. And when all the, of the intercession has finished, then Allah will say, the prophets have interceded, the truthful have interceded, the martyrs have interceded, and Allah will take out from the hellfire a handful of people who did no good deeds. And these are the people who have been saved from the intercession of Allah. These people who come out of the hellfire will be known as Jahannamis. And they will be put, they will come out burnt. Burnt like charcoal. And they will be cast into the river of life. And when they come into the river of life, they will become whole again. They will be known as Jahannamis. That is the people who used to be in the hellfire. Paradise, my brothers and sisters, there are seven gates to paradise. Each one is like the width of, I don't know, from Yemen to Hadramut, maybe I don't know, two, three, four, five hundred miles, massive. That's each gate, and each gate will be full. People will be pressing so much, they will be squashed up, going through the gates of paradise. And a person will go to their house in paradise, like they went to their house in this life. Like you know where your house is in this life, you'll know where your house is in paradise. What is paradise, brothers and sisters? What is this beautiful place? It is a place of rivers, rivers of milk, rivers of honey, rivers of wine. Not like the wine of this life. You drink too much of it, it gives you a big hangover, and you behave like a monkey. Okay? No. The, the Quran clearly states that this is a pure wine. This is a wine that does not intoxicate and befool and make the people stupid. It is a pure wine. Rivers flowing through paradise. Gardens, shade of the trees, fruits close at hand, thrones, cushions of silk, clothes of silk, green silk and gold brocade. Served by youths like scattered pearls of perpetual freshness. <clears throat> Things in paradise, everything that you could want. Everything that you could want. Physically, and all the men in paradise, let's not be shy. The firm breasted, wide eyed virgins of paradise. Yes, they, she is so beautiful. She is so beautiful. The whore of iron of paradise is so beautiful. These are the maidens to whom the men in paradise will be married to them. So beautiful. That if one tear was to fall from her eye into the oceans of this world, the whole of this world would smell of a beautiful perfume. So pure. Their crowns, just one jewel from the crown would give light to the heavens and the earth. See, paradise, the next life, brothers and sisters, you know, how can we think of it? You know, you can tell that, you know, the language that Allah and His Messenger talk to us, it's a real place, but it's something almost like a different experience. 
And these are the delights of paradise. And you know, no jealousy, no hatred, no envy, no greed. And I know the sisters are probably wondering, what's all this with the brothers in the borderline? Okay? Well, the news for the sisters is, they will be more beautiful than the Hura line. They will outshine the Hura line in their beauty. Yeah. That's right. So if those Hura line are beautiful, how are the people in paradise, the women in paradise going to be? Okay, yeah. The reward in paradise is for the men and the women. It's not just for the men, it's for the women too. Whatever you can imagine, whatever your heart's desire is going to be there. And you won't feel jealous. No, now maybe you're feeling jealous. Right? You won't feel jealous in paradise. You're not going to feel jealous in paradise. It's just nothing but happiness and peace. That's it. You know what? And the Quran says something, subhanAllah, really, there's such a beautiful thing about paradise. And Allah will say to the people that I am pleased with you and I will never again be displeased with you. You see, subhanAllah, all our misery in this life comes from doing things that are displeasing to Allah. That's the fact. That's what makes you miserable. A person is miserable because they're living in disobedience to Allah. But in paradise you can never disobey Allah again. Never. There's no forbidden fruit. No, you can never disobey. Allah will be pleased with us forever and never be displeased with us. But brothers and sisters, of all the beautiful delights in paradise, there is something that is more beautiful than all of those clothes and gold and fruit and pleasures and houses and mansions. We could just spend hours describing the things in paradise. But of all the things in paradise, the most beautiful and the most beloved things to the people of paradise is they will be able to look upon the face of Allah. They will be able to look upon the face of God. And of all the misery, and of all the suffering in the hellfire, worse than the fire, worse than the pus, worse than the zakoon, is that the people in hellfire will know that they will never be able to look upon the face of Allah. We ask Allah to give us paradise, to give us the righteous deeds that will lead us to paradise. We ask Allah to cause us to love Him and to love those who love Him and to be loved by those who love Him. And to love the deeds that will cause Allah to love us. We ask Allah to save us from the hellfire and from the torment of the grave. Allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Which is up with her, so